I am so excited to be here with all of you today. I am incredibly excited to get to learn from all of our gender equality delegate speakers who are solving our greatest problems through their work in education, journalism, technology, and health. Now, I was born 32 years ago in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. To Yes, I like that. To some Muslim Libyan parents. I was born at home because I could not wait to make it to a hospital, a fact my mom cites as evidence of my perpetual impatience. Now, growing up as a visibly Muslim child of immigrants meant that people often saw, judged, and treated me based on their misconceptions before and above anything else. That, and being the middle of 11 children, taught me the value of research, alliance building, diplomacy, negotiation, and the necessity of speaking up. So I guess I started to become a little impatient when global media and the public perception of Islam and Muslim women inspired me to research women's roles and rights in Islam. Now, as a person of faith, I view power through a lens of mercy and compassion. And I couldn't necessarily reconcile what I was hearing about women in Islam with my faith or with my own beliefs. So after graduating high school at 15, my so-called impatience packed a bag and traveled with me when I moved to Libya and enrolled in medical school. And at 21, my trusty, reliable sidekick impatience drove me during the Libyan revolution to create the voice of Libyan women an organization in my hometown of Zawiya, which would become a national organization and network to advance women's rights. And in 2012, when, while leading the voice of Libyan women, religious leaders cited religion as the reason for the ongoing exclusion of women, well, that's when I became incredibly impatient. I fully owned the title my mom gave me. See, this wasn't new to me. When throughout my teen years, global media created that perception, I chose to research it. And in the years since, it has been the most intentional thing I have acted on. So I needed to make it clear. From funding the Islamic faith in its infancy to safeguarding the Quran, the Islamic holy book, to transmitting Islamic hadiths, to starting the first universities, founding sciences, and now building schools and leading nations, women in Islam have always been, from the earliest days of the faith, strong social, political, economic, and security leaders. So it isn't, in fact, my faith that is restrictive towards women. It is culture, veiled as religious dictate, interpreted predominantly by male religious actors with underlying self-benefit, be it political, social, or economic. And my commitment and action to gender equality have always been shaped by my experiences and beliefs as a girl and woman, as a girl and woman of faith. So we led the largest campaign, which has reverberated globally, to fortify women's rights by elevating the messages of our religion's most revered texts, the Quran and Hadiths, the sayings of the Prophet, and using stories of historical figures as evidence and tools. Because this went beyond the personal. It went beyond just researching. It became and continues to be my most urgent and important issue. So I've been patiently and intentionally addressing it ever since. Now, in the years since, I have advised numerous heads of state, community and national organizations, driven UN Security Council resolutions, and catalyzed and secured the Sustainable Development Goals globally, enshrining women's rights and health. I currently lead global health programs, advocacy, and communications at the Gates Foundation, the largest philanthropic organization in the world where we support movements and organizations and individuals who are driving transformational policy, research, and advocacy at the intersection of health, gender, and development. And through our work, one thing is abundantly clear. The undervaluing of women and girls is at the root of every problem we must solve. We can't resolve poverty 
if women cannot access a bank account. We can't fight climate change if women and girls, often the most affected by severe weather events, are excluded. And we can't build beyond COVID-19 or build back from it if women and girls don't have access to health care. To do this, we must also better understand the extent of the problem. We need to invest much more in gender data and the quality of data we are collecting, especially for better financing. Without gender-specific data, the programs and policies fail to reach the women and girls they are designed and meant to serve. Every one of the world's 3.9 billion women, more than half the world's population, deserves opportunity, health, and dignity. And they must have the agency to make decisions, pursue those ambitions, and participate fully in society, both as a matter of principle and, critically, as a matter of policy. And boys and men have gender, too. We need you to be meaningfully engaged in advancing gender equality, and we need you accountable to challenge curtain social and gender norms that reinforce inequalities, because we all benefit when women and girls have autonomy over their health, bodies, and futures. We know that when women participate in peace agreements, the chance of the agreement lasting two years increases by 20%. It is 35 times more likely to last 15 years. If women participate in the economy to the same degree as men, the global economy will grow by an estimated 28 trillion by 2025, roughly equivalent to China's GDP. And reproductive rights and women's health access in particular are the fundamental components for women and girls to realize their full potential. Evidence shows us again and again that when girls and women have access to health care, they will choose if and when to marry, and if and when to have children, and more women will survive pregnancy-related complications. More children will survive childhood, because stronger families are powered by women. It means parents can dedicate resources to their kids' health and education, and more children will stay in school, because education is powered by women. And it means women can choose to work outside the home, earn an income, and be fairly compensated for their work and be decision makers in an equitable economy because strong economies are powered by women. Advancing the health of women and girls through access to healthcare services, increased resources for family planning, maternal health and nutrition, and preventing gender-based violence pays enormous dividends. Poverty rates go down, education goes up. In short, progress is powered by women. When we deny young women and girls ownership over their own bodies, we force them to live lives they do not want and do not choose. We rob them of their identity, we rob them of their power and agency, and we rob them of opportunity and dignity. And ultimately, we cheat ourselves of progress and peace. So together, we need to call on leaders around the world to invest in women and girls' health, because it is a non-negotiable if we genuinely want to achieve anything we have been talking about at One Young World. I especially encourage young leaders, like all of you, to engage politically, to drive sustainable equality. We need to change the decision makers, too. We need more inclusive, intergenerational political and corporate leadership that accepts that we, young people, are the experts of our own experiences and lived realities. And it is particularly imperative to finance and champion grassroots women's organizations, including the leaders here with us today. Because women and girls affected by challenges in their own communities know the right solutions to overcome them. I still remember those who amplified my own voice and agency 12 years ago when I was 21 and who enabled me to grow in my own political power. That is why I am here today. I'm here today because I was powered by women. I have always had a choice. And imagine what one world would look like if all young leaders have that choice, support, amplification of agency. 
So if I can bring it back to where I started. My faith is rooted in accountability and justice. It's why I so strongly believe and act for women's rights, regardless of what anybody tells me or anybody says. We have a very famous hadith or a saying of the prophet that says you speak up against those who have caused injustice, even if they are your own parents or siblings or children, and especially then. And that is where I think we are right now. Will we speak up? Will we speak up for one another? Will we demand the rights of one another? If you ask yourself, how am I advancing gender equality? Are you investing your voice, your credibility, your money and networks? In whatever space you hold power, your work, your school, your team, your faith community, your wallet, your family, your own home, especially your own home, are you leveraging your sphere of power to create justice and opportunity and space for others? Are you challenging the people closest to you? Are you supporting leaders in your community? And are you asking for support when you need it? Because change, durable, sustainable change, starts at home. And no movement has a star. Movements can have leaders. They don't have stars. That's why One Young World is meaningful. It gives us the space not to be impatient, but to be intentional, to learn from each other, to listen, collaborate, and pivot our priorities. Because without half the world, without women, we will not stop climate change. We will not end poverty. And we will not achieve peace. So if I can ask for anything, it is that I want every single person in this room to invest, to genuinely invest in women and girls in their community, whenever, wherever, and however. Hold yourself accountable because you are the one who will invest in and build this future. Thank you.